B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, January 9th, 2018. Lots of news to comment on today. Can he do it in 30 minutes? <laughs> That's a challenge I face every day. And already I've left a couple of stories on the cutting room floor. Hoping to brief you without overbriefing you. How's that? So uh, Vice News is reporting, and this is the only source that I've seen for this, that there is a strategic struggle going on inside the national security wing of the Trump White House. And it goes like this. Trump and H.R. McMaster, his national security advisor, are promoting the idea of starting a small war with Little Rocket Man. Now, their idea is that if Kim Jong-un continues to launch missiles and test nuclear weapons, that Washington will respond with a targeted strike against a single weapons facility. This, in the minds of uh, Trump and his advisor, would demonstrate to Kim Jong-un the power of the U.S. arsenal and the ongoing price it would pay for further weapons tests. Now, this is a highly risky idea. In fact, I think it is fucking insane. Pardon my language, but I think it's richly deserved in this case. And Vice dryly reports, advocates of the strategy contend that North Korea is unlikely to respond out of fear of annihilation. Opponents suggest a limited strike against a nuclear-armed rival could easily lead to all-out war. And who wants to find out? This is so stark, raving, crazy. And I really think that, uh, you know, it needs little further <laughs> elucidation. We know that there are millions of South Koreans who live within just a few miles of the 38th parallel. And without resorting to nuclear weapons, North Korea could launch a nasty assault on South Korea and kill millions of people in a very short period of time. And the idea that the United States could just selectively target one or a handful of military facilities in North Korea and get away with an attack is something I simply do not wish to test. Because Trump is saying, I am a crazier son of a bitch than Kim Jong-un is. Now, what we don't know is how many North Koreans Kim Jong-un is willing to sacrifice. It appears that there is no limit to a number like that. And when you look at the calculations that people are attempting to project here, what would Kim Jong-un do if we provoked him this way? Well, one of the things that this strategery ignores is the position of China. And I have reported this was buried in the New York Times last August, has been widely ignored. But Xi Jinping sent the signal that if North Korea is attacked, China would protect its ally. Now, it gets a little murky because they also said that if North Korea provokes this, that China will remain neutral. But frankly, I don't think that China would countenance a U.S. military attack on North Korea in any way, shape, or form. And what happened to our genius president, the stable genius, that he's been uh, blathering about for the last few days? And while Trump continues to look for his fulfillment of a war porn fantasy of some sort, the glory of being the commander-in-chief who orders this high-risk maneuver, the Koreans are talking 
and the U.S. is irrelevant. Yes, the meeting that was uh, triggered by Kim Jong-un's New Year's speech took place, and they have agreed that North Korea will field an Olympic team, and they are this close to an agreement that the North and South Olympic teams will march together in the symbolic opening ceremony. Now, I've also learned that they're having trouble selling tickets to the Olympics in South Korea, and this may solve that problem as well. In a joint statement, both Koreas also said that they would hold more high-level discussions, promote exchanges in various fields, including dialogue between their militaries to ease tensions and to foster national reconciliation and solidarity. Take that, Trump. Now, I am a sharp critic of this president. But when he does something right, I'm not afraid to acknowledge it. And today, with that flourish that he loves to put his big John Hancock on an executive order, Trump did something right. He addressed an issue that uh, Obama did not properly deal with, and that is suicides by America's veterans. And it is an ugly picture. A VA study showed that the risk of suicide is 19% among male veterans compared to male civilians, and two and a half times higher among female veterans than civilian women. And at least 20 veterans a day take their own lives. So, this is a, a great idea, and I fully support it. Trump has signed this order. Uh, giving the Defense Department, Homeland Security, and Department of Veterans Affairs 60 days to put together a program to provide mental health services on day one of a soldier's retirement from active duty. This is focused on 60% of new veterans who don't qualify for care until the government establishes that a medical issue has ties to their military service. It calls for seamless access to mental health treatment, suicide prevention resources for transitioning service members. And uh, this guy Shulkin, uh, Shulkin is a medical doctor who is the head of the Department of Veterans Affairs, and his uh, first name is David. David Shulkin has identified suicide among veterans as his top clinical priority and determined that people who've left the military within a year are between one and a half to two times as likely to commit suicide as any other age group. And over at the Pentagon, they'll expand the services of the Military One Source program to apply to veterans for a full year after leaving the military rather than just six months. And Shulkin said there are about 265,000 service members who transition out of the military each year, and the cost is projected to be a couple of hundred million dollars per year. And it's going to come out of existing budgets. I really have no criticism of this, except to say that it is long overdue. Dianne Feinstein is my very senior senator from California, and she's hogging the road and holding on to her Senate seat. She is planning to run for re-election this fall at the age of 84. And Dianne Feinstein is way too conservative and cautious for my tastes, and I'd like her to retire. And so I am shocked (laughs) and pleasantly surprised that Di Fi has gone rogue. And last night, Rachel Maddow did a good job of providing some history and context, rare for America's news channels. But she trotted out footage of my old pal Mike Gravel, the former senator from Alaska. He ran for president back in 2008, was widely derided for that effort. But I've known Mike for over 10 years, and I like him a lot. And he did a great service back in uh, 1971 as a freshman senator when he read the Pentagon records into uh, the Pentagon papers into the congressional record. Maddow showed how it was via the obscure, uh, uh, what is it, like the Public Works and Grounds uh, subcommittee that Mike Gravel was the chair of. So... What Dianne Feinstein did was to piss off Chuck Grassley, who is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and without waiting for him to finally take action and honor a pledge that he has made, she unilaterally uh, unilaterally released the interview transcript 
with Glenn Simpson of Fusion GPS, which took place this past August. Last week, we reported to you how Simpson and his co-founder, Peter Fritsch, went to the op-ed pages of the New York Times with a very carefully spun op-ed demanding that this be released and their side of the story be made available to the public. Feinstein said the American people deserve the opportunity to see what he said, judge for themselves. The innuendo and misinformation circulating about the transcript are part of a deeply troubling effort to undermine the investigation into potential collusion and obstruction of justice. So, good for you, Diane. I strongly support this, and I'd like to see you go rogue more often. Hey, how about releasing the Senate Intelligence Committee report that you authored, fostered, and shepherded on America's torture program under the Bush administration? That should not be locked up the way it is. So, what does the transcript tell us? Well, the early reports indicate that Christopher Steele, the former British spy who was hired by Fusion GPS after they started working for the Clinton campaign. And it's notable that Fusion GPS was not revealed. Uh, actually, the, the paymaster of Fusion GPS, which was the Clinton campaign, which tried to shield the contract by having lawyer Mark Elias be the middleman. And, of course, it was kept secret for over a year after the whole Russiagate uh, scenario surfaced. So one of the key details that I've been demanding is that the transcript indicates that Chris Steele first reached out to the FBI with his message that he was witnessing a crime in progress in early July of 2016. Now, we are still looking for the timeline entries related to the twin attempts, the first unsuccessful, the second apparently successful, to get the super-secret FISA court to issue a super-secret warrant to allow surveillance of one or more people on the Trump campaign, probably starting with Papadopoulos. We also hear the account from Glenn Simpson my understanding was that they believed Chris at this point. They believed Chris might be credible because they had other intelligence that indicated the same thing. And one of those pieces of intelligence was a human source inside the Trump organization. Now, this is going to start a guessing game about who that leaker might be. He added his understanding was the source was someone who had volunteered information to the FBI, or in his words, someone like us who decided to pick up the phone and report something. So this is interesting. I look forward to seeing more from those transcripts. And if there's something there, I'll report on it to you forthwith. There's a lot of anticipation among the legal beagles working for Trump regarding the special counsel investigation. And in the meeting they held with Mueller in late December, it was conveyed that Mueller wants to interview Donald Trump. And if you were Trump's lawyer, wouldn't you be scared to death allowing that guy who, <laughs> you know, can't control himself, he compulsively says things, he has attention deficit, he, he's a mess. Now, according to the New York Times, in business lawsuit depositions in the past, Trump has shown discipline when under oath. But if you ask him, did you obstruct justice when you fired Jim Comey? Is he going to say, is he going to have a disciplined response? I don't think so. And one way around this that the lawyers are considering is to shift to a written query and answer approach. And that would allow the lawyers to fully lawyer any statements that Trump makes to the special counsel. It's not clear if that would be acceptable to Counsel Mueller. So I, I want you to look at this next set of stories in sequence because Trump made a dramatic shift on immigration today. And, of course, we can't believe a word of it because this guy will say anything and uh, contradict himself at any moment. But consider this. Yesterday, the New York Times reported that the Trump administration was moving heaven and earth in terms of budget 
to come up with enough money to build a, a six or seven hundred mile wall along the southern border. And they're shifting money from patrol boats, radar, radar technology, uh, human agents, boots on the ground, because they want to get the Congress to cough up enough money to build, capital T, capital W, the wall. And the Times has some interesting quotes about the wall. From the conservative Cato Institute, David Beer said a border wall would do little to stop the drug trade. Most cocaine, heroin, and meth that comes into the U.S. come through legal ports of entry. Nor would a wall stop illegal immigration. Data from the Department of Homeland Security shows that most undocumented immigrants now simply overstay legally obtained short-term visas. Yes, they come in through the airports. They do not swim the Rio Grande. But the fantasy of the wall is something that Trump shares with his restive base. And they want to try to build at least 74 miles of a border wall for about $1.6 billion dollars. Uh, just to show that Trump was really serious. But today, everything's different. And our stable genius president presided over an extended meeting with congressional Republicans and Democrats. And the focus was pretty narrow about the DACA hostage group that uh, Trump has made of so-called dreamers and about various shifting demands to end so-called chain migration and also to uh, make other moves to tighten border security. But Trump did not mention the wall in the quotes that are being surfed up by the New York Times from this, uh, what appears to be a remarkable, a remarkable meeting. Now, again, I, I caution that anything Trump says uh, cannot be believed. But he says he supports a two-phased approach that would first codify the protections created under DACA and then address other issues. And Democrats are insisting that the program be part of any long-term agreement to fund the government beyond January 19th. But Trump appears to be upping the ante here and encouraging the elected officials to take on a much bigger bite. We'll see where all that goes. Every day I pause for a second and thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. And January is the month when a lot of annual subscriptions renew. And I'm seeing a wave of people who are canceling their annual subscriptions. And I don't feel, you know, I, I don't try to drum up any guilt or bad feeling. I appreciate that people have been subscribers. But uh, three annual subscribers uh, canceled their renewals on January the 7th. And that leaves room for you, my friend, who's been listening for a while. you got a little money in the bank, and you've always wanted to support the Peter B. Collins podcast. Well, I'd like you to step up and replace these individuals who, for whatever reason, have moved on. And I also want to thank stalwarts like Joe Carson, Susan Gavet, Tim McKay, uh, they send me five or ten bucks every month, and they've been doing it for a long time, and I really appreciate it. If you'd like to get involved and support the podcast, visit PeterBCollins.com, find the menu tab, click on that, then click on Become a Subscriber. A subscriber. It takes you to the sign-up page, and boom, in just a minute or two, you can set up a monthly PayPal contribution. And if you're allergic to PayPal, I understand. You can write me a letter. You can send me a check, money order, or cash. No coins, please. Uh, my mailing address is box 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. I'll repeat that for you. Box 150660, San Rafael, California, 94915. Now, during the campaign in 2016, in a very ugly series of comments and tweets. Donald Trump inserted himself in the case here in San Francisco, the tragic waterfront death of Kate Steinle, and an undocumented immigrant who has various names, the most commonly used is Jose Inez Garcia Zarate. Well, he was charged with murder, manslaughter, felon in possession of a weapon, 
And the only charge the jury convicted him on was the last one, felony in possession of a, uh, a, a, a felon in possession of a weapon. Despite that, federal prosecutors, probably at the behest of justice in Washington, have really entered a double jeopardy uh, attempt. And they have charged Garcia Zarate with being a, a felon in possession of a weapon. And also they are trying him on a federal warrant out of Texas, alleging a probation violation. Now, last week, the state court that convicted uh, Garcia Zarate on the single count released him to federal custody to face these charges. And if these charges weren't there, they would have released him to federal custody for the purpose of deportation. But Trump and the immigration nationalist provocateurs want to keep this human being as a political football for as long as possible because it riles up the white base. And fortunately, Tony Serra, the legendary San Francisco defense lawyer who I've known for over 20 years, has stepped up to represent Garcia Zarate in this federal case. And he is bringing a motion to dismiss on the basis of double jeopardy. And if you recall, when this first surfaced, I consulted an attorney and said, gosh, isn't this double jeopardy? And he said, no, it's simply a federal prosecution on a, a, you know, a similar charge. But Sarah maintains that he can get this dismissed if he's able to prove that federal authorities and the San Francisco prosecutors colluded. Did the feds aid and abet in the state prosecution? Were they in the background directing strategy and trial tactics? That's what we hope for here. So we'll see where that case goes. In Washington, Democrats in the Senate responding to the outpouring of opposition to the FCC's move to dismantle net neutrality last year, they are gaining ground. Ed Markey of Massachusetts now has 40 co-sponsors for a congressional measure that would invalidate the FCC's recent action. And get this, they are using the Congressional Review Act, which Republicans and Trump used to roll back uh, Obama-era regulations, particularly those that were put in place in the final year, of Obama's second term. So this is delicious use of the same <laughs> uh, legislation. And Markey says that he will work to build support for this over the next few months. Now keep in mind that the resolution, even if it passes the Senate with a majority, it must clear the House and be signed by the president who supported the repeal of net neutrality. The Supreme Court Heard oral arguments are actually they're scheduled for Wednesday for tomorrow on a case coming from Ohio. And this is one of the many elements of Republican voter suppression schemes. It is purging people who haven't recently voted from the voter registration rolls. And in Ohio, Secretary of State John Husted attempted to do that before the 2016 elections peeling 2 million people off the rolls, which had 7.7 .7 million eligible Ohio voters. That is a major chunk. And they essentially used an official process that is the same as what Greg Pallast has referred to as voter caging, a favorite tactic of Karl Rove, the Republican strategist. And what they do in Ohio is the registrar mails a postcard to uh, a, the local voter asking them to confirm their address. And if they don't return the postcard or fail to vote in a federal election for the next four years, their names are automatically removed from the voter registration rolls. This is an insidious process. There should be no penalty for not voting. After all, <laughs> 70 million registered voters did not cast a ballot in the 2016 election. And nobody is sanctioning them. Now, I deplore people who don't participate. At the same time, I recognize it is their right. 
And it'll be very interesting to see what the Robert Roberts Court does with the Husted case. There's another one coming before the court related to whether the police can search the premises of your house, like your garage, your backyard, or your parked vehicle. And the case arises from a guy named Ryan Collins in Virginia, no relation to your humble host. And he rode a motorcycle, went to his girlfriend's house, where he placed a cover over the motorcycle and parked it in the back of the driveway beneath part of the house. And legally, the area around your house is called curtilage, the legal name for structures that surround a house like a porch or a garage. The officer went into this area at the back of the driveway, lifted the cover on the motorcycle, and discovered that Collins had been riding a stolen motorcycle. And the state of Virginia says that the cops didn't need a warrant They don't need one to search vehicles, as long as they have probable cause. It's an interesting case, and uh, I can't predict how the court will rule. A couple of good stories about surveillance over at The Intercept today. Alex Emmons is uh, following the work of the House of Representatives as they attempt to renew Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and in simple terms, 702 allows them to uh, access the wiretaps or other recordings of, for example, a Skype call or a phone call that I make to a friend in England or France or in Iran. Legally, they couldn't get it because I'm an American citizen, but because this is incidental to their wiretapping of my contact outside the country, They claim that it's legal. Now, it's a bipartisan group of privacy advocates in the House who are working to try to fine-tune this, to require that the government get a warrant before they search their collected databases uh, on American, on U.S. persons, as the term is used. And so far, they tried to pass a... a, a, uh, a resolution, or at least an amendment, back in December. They had to back off. They didn't have enough votes. But the bill that's currently on the table carves out some big exceptions. The FBI doesn't have to apply for a warrant when national security is involved, when it determines that there is a threat to life or serious bodily harm. That's the ticking time bomb myth that they love to use to scare the shit out of lawmakers. And uh, so... This is a, a, an open struggle, and we're not getting much coverage on this from the corporate media. And while I have my problems with The Intercept, their reporting on this is solid, as is the latest output from Trevor Aronson, who writes about a subject that uh, is, uh, is something I care a lot about. And I've used the term most recently about uh, the evidence that has been gathered in the Trump-Russia investigation and the term of art called parallel construction. And in today's piece, which I've linked to in the show file for the podcast, Trevor Aronson talks about how agents of the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, started using parallel construction because they were accessing sensitive and unconstitutionally collected surveillance product on certain suspects. They'd go bust the people, and then they would create a parallel construction for the evidence that they had gotten but would not use in court proceedings. And there are cases where they have staged car accidents in order to search a car without a warrant and without uh, any (laughs) probable cause. And there are other cases where they have used pretextual situations in order to build parallel construction of cases where they got the evidence from secret channels that they cannot bring out in court. I hope you'll read it. I think it's an important set of concerns. Over in Iran, the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, has ratcheted up his criticism of Trump. 
And I don't know if he feels left out because Trump hasn't given him a nickname, uh, hasn't recently tweeted threats to, <laughs> to launch nuclear missiles on Iran. But the Ayatollah called Trump a psychotic. And he tweaked him on Twitter. He says the Iranian government is afraid of U.S. power. So if we are afraid of you, how did we expel you from Iran in the 1970s and expel you from the entire region in the 2010s? And he went on to say, they, the United States, damaged us during these days, referring to the recent protests. They know there will be some sort of retaliation. This man who sits at the head of the White House, although he seems to be a very unstable man, he must realize that these extreme and psychotic episodes won't be left without a response. Now, at least 21 people have died in the protests. The, uh, the number of people arrested officially is uh, estimated at 1,000, unofficially uh, closer to 4,000. But get this, the elected prime minister, actually president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, has a very different take. He lashed out at his hardline opponents, saying the protesters were not just uh, objecting to the weak economy, but also to widespread corruption, the clerical government's restrictive policies on personal conduct and freedoms. Rouhani said one cannot force one's lifestyle on future generations. The problem is that we want two generations after us to live the way we like them too. He went on, some imagine that the people only want money and a good economy. But will someone accept a considerable amount of money per year when, for instance, the cyber network would be completely blocked? Is freedom in the life of the people purchasable with money? Why do some give the wrong reasons? This is an insult to the people. Those are very different perspectives. And finally today, since Sunday night's Golden Globes, there has been a wave of commentary from Democrats, progressives, and the American left in general about whether Oprah Winfrey would make a great candidate for president in 2020. And I view this as uh, identity politics in extremis. And it's a distraction for the Democrats that wasn't caused by a Trump tweet. <laughs> this one is self-inflicted. So over at the New York Times, Alexander Burns and Amy Chozik note that while Winfrey has disavowed any ambition to be a candidate in the past, she has not ruled it out since the speech at the Golden Globes. Obama's brain, David Axelrod, said after the obligatory praise of Oprah, would she want to submit herself to the unforgiving, relentless, and sometimes absurd process of running for president? Will there be a hunger in 2020 for someone with experience in government after Trump? And Democratic strategist, uh, strategist Rebecca Katz, described as a progressive, says beating Trump isn't just about finding the right candidate. We have to show what we stand for, other than... We all get a car. What will an Oprah presidency look like? And more serious commentary in an op-ed at uh, The Guardian by Brianna Joy Gray. She cites that people like Sarah Silverman, Asif Manvi, Joanne Reed, and Sean King have all tweeted their support for Oprah 2020. And then she says, the enthusiasm around the mere specter of Oprah's presidency reveals an uncomfortable truth about the hypocrisy of Democrats. All the talk of competency during the 2016 election, qualifications, are mere pretexts for their choice of candidate. In the build-up to an aftershock from the 2016 election, the loudest and most consistent protest heard from Clinton supporters was, but she's the most qualified. Despite having a longer record of public service, Senator Sanders was deemed less and by some insufficiently qualified to run for president. In fact, Sanders' candidacy arguably took its biggest hit when he suggested that Clinton's history of poor political judgments, like her vote for the Iraq War, disqualified her for the presidency. Hillary's qualifications were considered so unassailable that the challenge to them was considered de facto sexism by many. And she goes on to say, like many who have endorsed Oprah, I share the view that ideology and judgment should play a greater role in our choice of leadership than mere political experience. Presidents have an incredible influence over our political imagination. They teach us what is possible and have the power to expand or limit our political expectations. 
For this reason, I voted for the candidate who advocated Medicare for all over the one who preached that single-payer would never, ever come to pass. But ideology is not identity. An identity, whether based in race, gender, or celebrity, is not enough. And she closes by saying, Anyone who pretends to know that Oprah is qualified based on her public persona alone is all talk and no show. And from a Facebook thread that was posted by a university professor I know who wrote, My timeline is split 50-50 between those who think Oprah should run and those who think it's ridiculous. So here are a couple of just uh, uh, selected comments from her Facebook friends. Laurel says, what I want, a candidate may not run for POTUS without first serving the public in at least one prior elected role. Somebody else mentions the frequent photographs that uh, we are seeing these days of Oprah with Harvey Weinstein. Here's April. My kids need to perform a certain amount of community service volunteer hours to graduate high school. You'd think running for president would require a little more public service than a high school diploma. Skip says uh, to the comment of the poster that she's on the fence, you're not the only one. Edward says, I feel similarly conflicted. Jessica says, I'd like to see her lend her voice to a good candidate but not run herself. David says, yes, I love Oprah too, but no, we don't need another billionaire celebrity with no record of public service or any evidence of an understanding of what it takes to legislate and govern. Angela says, what exactly shows she has qualifications for the kind of policy and strategy work that we need for an effective president? Okay. Uh, let's see. Carol with a K. She knows how to govern. Governing is essentially management. Business people have been running for public office since the Founding Fathers' time. It would be great to have someone progressive in politics who isn't entrenched in D.C. politics. And then uh, Sarah says, yeah, and business people are pretty trash at government. <laughs> Elizabeth, I'm 100% on the fence as well. Doug, two words, Jenny McCarthy. Two more words, Dr. Phil. And another two words, Dr. Oz. Uh, I have no comment except to say, NOPRA 2020. <laughs> Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's free and you're free to share it with everybody. It's posted on YouTube. Did you know? Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.